Hi, I'm Guy Powell, and welcome to the next episode of The Backstory on the Shroud of Turin. If you haven't already done so, please visit guypowell.com and sign up for more episodes. I am the author of the upcoming book, The Only Witness, A History of the Shroud of Turin. It is a historical fiction tracing possible yet plausible history of the Shroud over the last two millennia. Today, we'll be speaking with uh, Cheryl White, who is professor of history at the Louisiana State University at Shreveport. And she is curator of an educational art exhibit as well at the Cathedral of St. John Birchman's. And you can find out more at uh, sjbcathedral.org. And we'll have certainly more information about that as we move on. But before we get started, let me tell uh, a short story. A few weeks ago, my wife and I were up in Washington, D.C., and we were visiting the Museum of the Bible where their new shroud exhibit was launched. It's definitely a bucket list item, and I recommend that you uh, get there before they, uh, before they close it, which is right now scheduled for July, and then, of course, complain that they need to extend it. In any case, it is an awesome exhibit. Uh, the Shroud of Turin is the only witness of the moment of Jesus' resurrection, and they have all of the pieces that uh, that show oh, so many different things about, about the, uh, the shroud itself and then about that moment as well. And this is where we met Cheryl White. Uh, I've known of her and her name and her speaking and everything. I've seen her on videos. And today she's been kind enough to join us uh, to talk about the shroud, uh, which is near and dear to my heart. And I know it is to uh, Cheryl's heart as well. So, uh, but in any case, the Museum of the Bible is uh, a place to go, and if you get a chance, please visit, and uh, if you really get a chance and want to see the Shroud, uh, that exhibit is up and, and uh, available through the end of July. So with that, let me introduce Cheryl. Uh, Cheryl White is a PhD and professor of history at Lu Louisiana State University at Shreveport, where she holds the endowed Hubert Humphreys Professorship. Her primary field is medieval and early modern Europe. She has been engaged with uh, Shroud Scholarship for nearly 30 years, and she's probably forgotten more than I'll ever know. <laughs> but uh, in any case, uh, she is member of the American Confraternity of the Holy Shroud. She is a board member of the Shroud of Turin Research and Education Association with Russ Brio and of course, Barry Schwartz. Co-host, and she's also co-host of a popular international podcast series, Who is the Man of the Shroud? Cheryl, uh, welcome and so glad to have you. Thank you, Guy. I'm glad to be here. Thank you for asking me. Oh, absolutely. It's so good to talk to you. And so anyway, tell us uh, your backstory on how you got involved with the Shroud of Turin. You know, it's interesting that my story with the Shroud seems to run sort of in parallel with my academic career, um, as does my own a personal faith journey sort of runs parallel with that as well, in that I was um, actually a new Catholic in, uh, in, in college, and the early 80s were when the very first results from the carbon-14 dating, uh, excuse me, the very first results, that was later, the very first results began to be published in peer-reviewed journals in the early 1980s from the 1978 START project, and so I was very interested in uh, this artifact, because I was I was interested in um, in religious relics. I was interested in art. Um, I had an interest in the Middle Ages. It, there were so many different things compelling to me about it. But most importantly, what 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 drew me in is I think what draws everyone in, and that is the mystery, the great unanswerable questions that that draws everyone in. And then in 1988, when the carbon 14 dating pub, uh, was published, I remember taking a step back, as did many people taking a step back and saying, well, okay, this is an interesting artwork. Um, and, and as a medieval historian, by then I was in graduate school, uh, I became interested in how this was created. What was the process? Who was the artist? How could this possibly have been done? While all the while that scientific evidence was mounting, you remember we, we first knew uh, that there was, it was not a painting. It was not um, an artwork. It's not a photograph. It, it's, it, there's no there's nothing there on the cloth that accounts for the image formation process. And yet we've got all this evidence mounting about now about blood type, about pollen evidence, about soil evidence, uh, none of which really in my mind ever could be reconciled with a 
13th or 14th century date for an artwork. Knowing what I knew about the Middle Ages and knowing about the cult of relics, and uh, you mentioned uh, when we were talking before, uh, and I don't want to take anything away from Dr. Casper tomorrow, but but that culture of the copy um, that that we referenced, you know, this, this medieval society that um, authenticity was not necessarily the first question that anyone had uh, about a relic, and so. I was fascinated as to how that that era and that culture would have produced something so complex and so perfect. So that's really what what grabbed a hold of me and has never let me go. And even even in those years when we weren't sure about the dating of the cloth, I never let go of the fascination I had with its process of creation and and just as importantly, what its meaning is. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and the meaning is, uh, whether it's real or not, uh, the meaning and all of the the reflection of the Gospels, I think, as uh, John Paul, Pope John Paul said, the reflection of the Gospels that are seen in there are just so meaningful that, uh, you know, it really is, uh, it really is the, you know, a witness to the, to the resurrection. And uh, that's right. Yeah. That's but, you know, it's funny because 1978, I remember uh, reading about that as well with the STIRP project and the STIRP results. And that was not a painting and it wasn't dyed and it wasn't all these different scientific tests that had been run. And um, and then I, I said, wow, that is really fascinating. And um, and then in 1988, you know, the radiocarbon dating comes up and, and it just I said, oh, it's fake, you know. <laughs> Right. That's true. At one moment. A lot of people, a lot of people took a step back in 1988. I think that's fair to say. Yeah. 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 Well, and now, uh, and then of course, uh, for me, uh, Ian Wilson, uh, my brother sent me uh, one of his books, uh, and this is maybe 15 years ago. It was uh, the blood in the shroud by Ian Wilson. And, and that's really was the impetus for me to get to the, to start writing my book. And, uh, and then all of a sudden, uh, like you were saying, all of the scientific research that's really now kind of debunked the debunkers of the, the radiocarbon dating. Right. right. And, and, you know, I just, um, I just gave a presentation yesterday to, uh, to a group of middle schoolers, which I really, I have to tell you, I love speaking to young people about the shroud because I think even more than we do, um, they, there's, they've been raised in an era that is so empirical, and um, and it's it's the the prove it to me, um, you know, uh, epistemology, which there's and there's nothing wrong with that, but they get it, I think, in so many ways that we don't. And when I when I laid out all of the the scientific evidence from the shroud to this group, and then I introduced the specter of the carbon fourteen dating. I mean, almost to a single one of them, they said, well, you can't take one test if all of the rest of this says something else. And I thought, you know, that's, that's really, that's, that's how the science should play out, um, is that you sort of have to look at that as an outlier. Certainly what we know now about the, 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 um, the violation of the protocol, um, where the samples were taken from in the claw, um, I mean, I do think we have to look at it increasingly more and more as an outlier, but, but you know, as well as I do, that's the very first thing people seize upon who want to be skeptical about it. That's the very first thing they seize upon. Yeah, and no question about that. And uh, when I read, uh, you know, online, you can read all of the skeptics and where the anti-shroudists, and that is absolutely the first thing that they, they seize upon. Right. And their first, the, almost the first sentence is, and of course, this has been proven false by radiocarbon dating. Right. And, right. and, and then they go on with everything else that they think is fake. And so it's, it's really, it is really a, a shame as to what happened in 1988. And, the, and the, you know, I've, I've almost, I, I've adopted sort of a, a, an attitude now, because I do think that people who are skeptical are maybe may still be, be seeking uh, some kind of understanding. So a lot of times I'll put that question back when, when I do hear that, you know, well, that's been proven to be a fake. It's been proven to be a, to be a fraud. Um, and I'll always sort of now say, well, do you know anything else about the shroud? Do you know anything else about it besides the carbon 14 dating? And almost always the answer is no. Um, and so I think that if we can um, use it as a, as a way of, of, uh, of inviting people into the mysteries I was speaking about with my own journey, 
inviting people into the mystery. You don't have to believe that it's the burial cloth of Jesus Christ to be compelled to know more about this incredible artifact. How true, how true. And, 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 then, and then just to think that in the uh, 13th century when there, or the 14th century when there's really the first evidence, written historical evidence that yes, this shroud exists. And then right. to say, well, wait a minute now. So how did, how did somebody come up with the oh, idea to paint a painting like that and then where are all of the practice shrouds or practice images that they did? Um, right. I remember going into uh, Marc Chagall's uh, museum in Southern, Southern France, France. and, uh, yeah. and in, the museum is shaped like a circle and the outside are all his drafts of all of the, the pictures on the inside. And right. the first thing I did is I went through all the drafts and he had hundreds of drafts before he would go and actually, you know, paint that beautiful you know piece of artwork that he would put together and of course there were many of them there and so if that's so the case that's where are all the practice pieces that would have gone with the uh, the painting of the shroud if it were really painted sure and that's certainly true for us i mean the great masters michelangelo did drawings rafael sanzio did drawings um uh, leonardo da vinci in his notebooks sketched out his ideas before he created an artwork so so I think that's part of the artistic process. And, and I agree with you. I think that's a big question a lot of people should have. Um, the, the biggest challenge for anyone who wants to suggest that this is a medieval artwork or an ancient one for that matter, the biggest challenge is explaining the perfection of the image, <laughs> the complexity yeah. of the image, something that we really can't recreate in, in 2022. Yeah, yeah. Well, and not only complexity of the image, but also the complexity of how the image mixes with the blood and then also with the, um, the liquid, I can't remember the name of it, that came out of the, the wound out of, his, uh, out of Jesus' chest. And right. How all of that, exactly, how all of that would have been applied concurrent or separate by an artist that would have otherwise drawn that image. And it just, there's just no way that it all could, could, could compute to be that accurate. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. And here's another way I think we have to look at the shroud. Um, when we're speaking of it, uh, when people suggest that it is a forgery, and I've heard this before too, uh, the use of the word forgery to describe the Shroud of Turin has always bothered me because whatever it is, it is not a forgery. Um, if it is, in fact, some incredible medieval artwork that we don't understand the process or process we've lost it's certainly not a forgery it is a remarkable artwork that depicts one man of human history and can't be confused with anyone else so so whatever it is it's not that it's a perfect icon it's a mm. perfect icon if you want to call it anything um we certainly have to say it's that yeah no i think so so let me uh, switch over to a, a couple okay. of things um one of the things that fascinates me, there's three or four eras over the last two, millennial, where, two millennia where uh, there's some interesting things that go on with the shroud and how potentially there's one history and I call them a history. Uh, there's one history that may have taken it through Edessa. There's one history that may have taken it through Antioch. Uh, there's another history of how it potentially got from Edessa over to um, over to Constantinople and then Constantinople, maybe to Athens and then up to Leary. And then finally in Lyra, France, where it was documented that this, that, that this cloth existed. So uh, let's maybe talk about a couple of different theories that uh, relate to how it got from Golgotha uh, over to the tomb. And then from there uh, at some point to, um, you know, who knows? I mean, there's there's reasonably good evidence that it got to Constantinople, but uh, let's talk about that a second. Yeah, so this is what I've spoken about. Almost every time I speak on the history of the Shroud, this is what I will tell people is that we are so confounded by our vocabulary. We are limited by mere vocabulary. So what we're talking about is because we do not know if we cannot make um, any sort of a link between some of these references, direct links historically. And I'm a purist in this regard, which you might expect from a PhD in history, in that if it is not in the written record, we cannot read it any other way. We cannot read into the record something that is not there. 
And so um, before 1578, obviously this cloth is not called the Shroud of Turin. So, so when you see a reference to the burial linen of Christ in the Imperial Relic Inventory in Constantinople, and you see a, a, a mention of the, the image of our Lord that stood straight up every Friday at the Church of St. Mary de Blecarni in Constantinople. Are we talking about the same cloth that's in Turin, Italy today? And, and I think that those are logical connections to make. Some of this is a little more problematic for me. Um, and, and if you don't mind, I'll sort of share with the listeners kind of what I think is the most plausible uh, sort of historical journey of the shroud. Um, if, if you want to think that it, that it left the tomb in Jerusalem um, on, a, on a probably, a, maybe not Sunday morning, maybe it was Sunday afternoon, but it left the tomb. I mean, we certainly would have believed that it would have been in the apostolic community. If in fact, this is the burial cloth of Christ, the, the apostolic community would have had it um, I actually see no contradiction. You mentioned that there's a historical route that takes it through Edessa, and there's one that takes it through Antioch. I don't see any contradiction in those. I think it could have been both, both and. And actually, I'm rather inclined to think it is, and I'll tell you why. Um, St. Athanasius of Alexandria in the fourth century is recalling tradition uh, when he gave a homily about uh, a relic that was a, 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 an image of our Lord at full length that was taken from Jerusalem to Antioch when Jerusalem fell in the year 70. So if he is referencing something that is, that is reliable tradition of the church at that time of the early fourth century, um, then its journey to Antioch does not preclude that it could have ended up in Edessa as well. Um, so I believe that it probably was both places. I believe that it was probably held in Edessa until the 10th century when we know that something arrived in Constantinople, August 16th of 944, that was purported to be the burial linen of Christ. I mean, the emperor sent someone to get it from Edessa. So I think that's logical that, that that's, that's what happened. And then I believe that it was in Constantinople until 1204 when that city was sacked. Now, the problem is the next 140 plus years. Between 1204 and 1355, or what I call the missing years, we do not have a reliable record of any kind. I know that Dr. Ian Wilson places it in, in Athens. I know that, that um, and I have great respect for him. I have great respect for Russ Brio. He and I have talked about this uh, quite a bit, that, that it ended up in the possession of a man named Othon de la Roche, and that's how it ended up in the family of Geoffrey de Charny by marriage. In Lee Ray, France, it shows up in 1355. I can't make that, that Athens link. And the reason I can't make it is because there's a lack of a primary source document. The original of those papers, if they existed, the original is lost. So I cannot, uh, in good conscience, as a, as a professional historian, go by a secondary account or a third-hand account. Um, I'm much more interested in trying to find that primary reference mm -hmm. to what happened to it, that whatever day it disappeared from Constantinople, that's what I'm interested in. So, and then I think we know the, we know the record well from 1355 to now, we know where it's been. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I agree with you. And, and uh, you know, that's kind of the fun part. There's a couple of thoughts that came to mind. And one is that, uh, and for me, even, uh, you know, the timing as it got to Constantinople and then the timing as it got to, uh, you know, up to Lyra, uh, you know, there is a lot of uncertainty in there. Certainly there were historical events that we know that took place that would have caused somebody that realized that this is the most important relic that he had in his possession and he had to protect it from the Romans in the 70s. Uh, in the 70 ADs to make sure that it didn't get destroyed. He would have had to, uh, if it was in Edessa or if it was in Antioch, he would have had to have protected it from the Sassanids and the Persians right. across. 
and uh, potentially even um, and. I know that there's there is some interesting evidence that in the 940s, I think it is that uh, the emperor, you know, received something from the Muslims that controlled Edessa. But for me, uh, you know, I always thought, and and I don't know, I maybe I think that's really what uh, is what was driving Ian Wilson as well as um, if I was a Christian and my city was about to be taken over. I would want to get any and all of the different uh, any and all of the different artifacts and relics out of the city before the the Muslims or even before that before the Sassanids came and I want to make sure that that gets protected and uh, and so then you know for me it's uh, it's kind of interesting to see that you know it could be that it it, it could be that the Muslims uh, had it and sold it then to the emperor or um, and then you know it'd be interesting to see if there's any primary evidence like you're talking about of of a 500, you know, uh, centenaria uh, payment that payment. might be made between the emperor and and uh, and the Muslims at that time, or something else that would have paid off them receiving this incredibly valuable relic. Right, right. Well, and I think that's when we have to look beyond history too to what to what the science tells us, and and of course, very broadly, you know, botany has contributed a lot to this. So we we kind of more or less know an environmental journey. Uh, that this cloth has taken. And it mostly aligns with the, the historical narrative I laid out. We know that it was in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. um, we know that it was at some point in its history in or around the old city of Jerusalem from the soil that is deposited there on the cloth. Um, we know it was on the Anatolian Peninsula uh, near the Black Sea. So that places it near Constantinople. And we know it was in Western Europe. So I, I actually think we have to look beyond history to try to corroborate uh, the gaps in the record. And, uh, and that's where I think a lot of the work of Sterp and beyond has been very important. Mm. Uh, we all sort of complement each other, but yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, and Sterp definitely started everything in, from 1978 moving forward. And uh, now I did Absolutely. also uh, interview uh, yeah, Jack Marquardt, Jack Marquardt and, and, uh, and he has a couple of interesting pieces of evidence that he believes that the shroud was actually in Constantinople until 1207. Right. And, uh, and so, you know, it's even interesting there as to how, how and what happened between those three years Did it leave, which kind of would make sense that, you know, if the, if the crusaders come in and they find you know, all this gold and all these other, uh, all these other pieces of art that they stole, as well as any art, you know, artifacts and relics that are just so important, that they would have wanted to take them and potentially, you know, keep them and, and keep them protected. And, uh, you know, when you think about the politics as well at the time with, uh, with the, uh, the, the, the crusaders taking everything and then the Pope saying, if you, if I find out you took something, I'm going to excommunicate you. So if and he I did. Took, yeah, exactly. So if I, and took, he did. yeah, yeah. If I took the, if I took the, uh, the shroud, I'm not going to tell anybody because I don't want to be excommunicated. That's exactly the culture that I think is responsible for those missing years. Uh, look, I've read Pope Innocent III's letters in response to, you know, um, it took several months for him to realize the extent of what had happened in Constantinople. He, he'd been lied to, essentially. And, uh, you know, in November 1204, he doesn't even know that, that the city's been sacked. It had been sacked, you know, five months before in July. But he didn't know that. And and then and then by the time of early 1205, it's beginning to dawn on him what has occurred. And the fury begins to come out in his letters. And he's just he's lashing out at everyone and basically issuing these mass writs of excommunication for anyone he can get the name of. So I definitely think that that would have contributed to if you had the shroud, would you have told anyone? I mean, I, I think that's why it went underground. Um, I have even entertained the idea, and this is just an idea, and it's certainly not, um, it's not based in anything historical, but I've, I've often entertained the idea if I were going to, if I were going to write a fantasy novel, um, if, if Pope Innocent III himself might not have had it at some point, um, you know, right after the Fourth Crusade, he launched a crusade against the, the, uh, the, uh, the Cathars, the Albigensian heresy of Southern France, mm. which was a Christological heresy 
that denied the um, the divinity of Christ. And so, you know, I've often wondered, well, what is that emblem that's, that they talk about in, in that crusade? What is the emblem that went at the head of that army? You know, um, I don't know. I find all that very fascinating, but, but we can imagine all sorts of things for those 140 plus years, I suppose. Uh, the truth is until we find that one document that we don't have yeah. right now, we won't know. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And it, it might actually be there. We might, it might actually be in somebody's closet somewhere. Now let's that's hope. right. That's <laughs> right. It'll definitely answer a lot of questions, that's for sure. Yeah. All right. So then uh, now getting up to uh, from there uh, to uh, Lee Ray, France. And uh, so, and however it got there, uh, whether it went through, you know, potentially um, the, you know, the King of France or whether it went through Othon de la Roche, you know, there's a couple of theories that way, but now right. we're in Lee Ray and now we have a, a, a written history that it's there. So what, by the way, is that written history? Uh, tell us about that. Well, the, the record is that Geoffrey de Charny, who was a, a knight of great distinction, by the way, he ended up dying about, um, Oh, gosh. Um, just a few years later at the Battle of Poitiers, serving the French king uh, during the Hundred Years War. But but the story is that that he um, is going to build a chapel in, in Ray, France, for the express purpose of displaying the burial linen of Christ. And so that's the record we have is that the, we have a record of that. We have a record of the church being built. We have a record um, that it went on public display. And actually seems to have not only been on display in Lee Ray, but, but we know that he occasionally traveled it around to different churches in that area of France. Um, we have a really good history of that uh, up until, of course, the time of the of the controversy, um, uh, which I don't know how much you want to get into the Darcy's memorandum, uh, which I think is is really spurious history, by the way. Um, this this whole idea that um, that somehow the shroud was proclaimed to be a forgery, and that the that the um, th this was this was a letter that uh, the bishop of Troyes was supposed supposedly wrote, and uh, 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 saying that the shroud could not be exhibited um, because it was a forgery, and he had met the forger, and he knew that it was it was some kind of a an artwork. Uh, the fact is that that memorandum, the Darcy's memorandum, as it's called, it was ne it was never sent. If if it was in fact an actual letter to to the to the uh, to the uh, the Pope in Avignon, it's the Avignon papacy at this point in time, why did he not send it? It was never sent, and, and so I, I'm very skeptical about that history. So then, of course, we we have a sort of an uninterrupted chain, and it goes back on public display, and uh, in 1453 it was transferred to the Savoy family. Uh, so we have a very good record of everything from that point forward. The fire of 1532, the repair of the cloth in 1534, its transfer to Turin in 1578. All of that history is just super clear. Yeah, well, and I'd like the uh, this uh, actually what um, and I think you brought it up as well at the uh, at the shroud launch at the Museum of the Bible, but also Andrew Casper uh, in that the uh, what Darcy uh, might have been seeing as the uh, the bishop of uh, Besançon. Is it bishop, was he bishop of Besançon or or Troyes or, or both? Well, I think I believe it was one diocese at the time. Oh, but yeah. That was, yeah. So yeah, anyway, and he, yeah, of Troyes, and um, and he. Um, yeah. He may have actually seen a copy. It may have been yes. the copy that he was thinking of as opposed to the, the original. And uh, interesting theory in terms of how that might have, in, you know, uh, confused the matter with, uh, with that bishop there. And, and then how then, nevertheless, the, the Leary Shroud was, uh, you know, and then really found to, be, uh, found to be authentic because the Pope then finally said to Darcy's, you know, hey, enough of this. <laughs> We're going to let him display that because we believe right. it is true. Right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very interesting. And uh, and how all that comes together, even though it's written. And now we have, you know, various written records. It, it always fascinates me is that you don't know exactly what the details are that were going on in the heads of the different people yet. And, uh, well, yeah. And that's that's where I think the, his, the the field of history has so much to contribute because because as historians, we are trained in the critical assessment of primary source materials, and there's so much more that goes into it than just reading the document itself. I mean, you have to understand the context 
most importantly, the context in which that document is written. What are the circumstances? What else might be motivating this person? So, so that we don't read into it something that's not there. What might be another explanation? Um, and, and so I, I don't think that, um, and having looked at that, I guess is what, what leads me to conclude that the Darcy's memorandum, as I said, I think is, is completely spurious as a historical document. Uh, I am very suspicious of the context of that and the motivation behind him writing it, especially when, when, as you said, the Pope responded, no, it must be, it must be displayed. So um, we don't know. We don't know those details. Yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 Well, you know, it's interesting too. That's that, that memorandum is usually then the second piece of evidence that the anti yes. <laughs> <used. laughs> yes. First it's the carbon 14 dating and then it's the Darcy's memorandum. Right. Yeah, right. exactly. Exactly. So, uh, yeah, so that's then France. And then uh, I found it also interesting. So it ends up in Chambéry and right. then, uh, with the Duke of Savoy. And yeah. uh, he now has possession of it. <clears throat> and I thought it was interesting, the politics and also the, the favor he was able to engender by making copies and giving copies of this absolutely, absolutely. you know, prized yeah. possession. Yeah. There is nothing like it, uh, and maybe never will be anything like yeah. it again. And he's the one that owns it. And yes, I'll I'll be glad to have a, a copy made of this for you. And yeah. and uh, what I was also surprised about was that he uh, would sew in individual threads to some of those oh, copies. Yeah. So that you right. have, uh, he would be cutting out pieces of the uh, potentially pieces of the shroud, take a thread out of that, and sew it into the copy to kind of give it that uh, the copy even more value. Well, right. Well, and it's it's actually it's um, from the Catholic understanding, of course. That is, that's creating uh, a second class relic. If you touch something to a first class relic, then you've created a second class relic. So that is part of the theology behind what he was doing and would have been well understood in the in that era certainly and is understood of course by the catholic world today um so it has more than than just um the kind of personal meaning to it it has deep theological meaning to it as well because now that other material has now taken on uh some some element or component of or perhaps even just have by contact with the um, the original, uh, it, it actually becomes a second class relic. If your understanding is that the shroud is the indeed the burial shroud of Christ, then it is a first class relic because um, all of the passion relics are first class relics. Jesus didn't leave any physical remains behind uh, that we know of. So um, so that is a, a first class relic, and that I, I listened to uh, to Dr. Casper's talk at the Museum of the Bible and found that fascinating. But I do think that that's a point that we need to make is that um, there is a religious understanding here too. It's not just a cultural one or a political one. In the case of the Savoys, you always have to wonder about the politics, but it's also the, profoundly theological. So, so yeah, the Savoy family was, was always interested in promoting, of course, their own dynasty, um, their own position and prestige for sure. Um, and it's not difficult to do when you own what you can claim to be the burial cloth of Christ. Yeah, there is some value in that. There's some value to that. <laughs> I would have it at every royal wedding too. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I'd have it at that at every, yeah, you name it, I'd have it. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So then um, let's talk about uh, two things. So now the, uh, the Duke of Savoy has it. He moves it from Chambéry to Turin. Uh, Cardinal Borromeo then comes and uh, is then part of then the one of the first displays of it. Talk about uh, some of the engravings that were made, and the, the, talk about some of the displays and some like something like and and some of that. And then what I want to do is we'll, we'll talk about the uh, the the grip that the different bishops would have on the on the on the shroud and how that might sure. have been uh, uh, deep uh, might have been you know uh, may, given problems for the uh, carbon fourteen dating. Right. So when um, when the uh, decision was made to bring the shroud to Turin in 1578, it was because remember that the, the Catholic Church had just been through the Great Reform Council of Trent, and uh, the Archbishop of Milan, uh, Arch Cardinal Archbishop of Milan uh, Charles Borromeo, 
was this great champion of reform uh, at the Council of Trent. He'd been responsible for for many of the reforms being instituted in his own um, in his own spheres of influence. He was a great advocate for for seminary education for priests and uh, and generally elevating the church, basically. So so when he wanted to go to Turin to I mean, excuse me to to Chambéry to venerate the shroud because. Um, he, he had, a, had actually had a great devotion to it. <clears throat> and there had most recently been a, um, a plague in Milan that he, he credited uh, the, the shroud and, and the, the image of, of Jesus's face as having spared that city. So um, they made the decision actually, that the Savoy family did to, to bring the, the shroud to him or to meet him sort of halfway. So they met in the city of Turin for that. We actually have a beautiful, there's a beautiful artwork that was commissioned uh, by the Savoy family in October of 1578 to commemorate that event. And it is uh, the 1578 Ostension is what it's called. It was done by an engraver named Giovanni Testa who did some really incredible work. And it shows, um, I don't remember, I can tell you without counting how many prelates of the church are holding this cloth, but right at dead center is Cardinal Archbishop Charles Borromeo depicted in that, in that engraving. So, so what that tells us is that um, how many people handled it on that particular day. Let's just take one day, one day of history, and then consider that every single year um, certainly beginning by the 17th century, there on the Feast of the Holy Shroud, it was the same, it was, it was exhibited every year and then taken out for special occasions as well. So we have all of these ostensions commemorated in artwork, in engravings. Beginning in 1578, there's another very famous one done in 1613. Um, then again, you know, into the 18th century, 1735, 8, 1750, um, straight up until, you know, the late 19th century. And in every single one of those commemorative engravings or commemorative artworks, there are probably at least two dozen people holding the shroud and they're holding it by the edge, right along the top edge, um, particularly, of course, on those corners. And the reason I think that's important is it, it gives us a historical clue that there may have indeed been some DNA contamination to this cloth that might have altered the dating of it. Yeah, exactly. And you know, and, and the pictures, just about every one of those engravings show how a big clump of the corner is taken. And, right. Uh, and and that right there, you know, there's got there is no question that there's palm, there's oil, all kind of palm, and that there's sweat. And if you're going to yeah. be holding it in the heat of the summer, you're going to be sweating and and then you know, all kinds of stuff going on. And, and I yeah. think the other thing that's interesting is, uh, and this is where I think uh, Sebastian Valfrey might come in, is um, there are potentially, potentially. He, he did some repairs to it, to the right. shroud, and uh, he didn't do a very good job based on what I found. And it's possible that then he also commissioned or was responsible for repairs. Because if you're right. holding, you know, for me, if you're going to hold... Uh, you know, a piece of linen, maybe, you know, a hundred times over the course of a, you know, a century or more, and maybe it's even more than a hundred times, that cloth is going to unravel. And especially sure. if it's always hold, held in the same way. And right. if you look at the cloth today, it's not, it's not unraveled it's not around the corners. So if that's so, the case, then was it potentially repaired? And then this Sebastian Valfre might be one of the ones that may have done some repair in uh, Turin on that, on those corners. Well, and we certainly know that that the poor players undertook a repair of the cloth in 1534, uh, following the fire, um, and and most likely introduced new fiber to the linen then as well. So um, I, I think that it's fair to say, looking at that 1988 carbon 14 dating, uh, thanks to the work of Tristan Casabianca and, and others. I mean, going back to Ray Rogers. Um, who was on the original STIRP team who didn't believe that carbon-14 result, um, that there's something chemically different going on in the area of the cloth that was tested. It's, it, it fluoresces a completely different color than the rest of the cloth, telling us there's something chemically different about it. 
And and you know, as as was pointed out at the at the at the conference in DC, and I'll repeat it for your listeners, um, taking one sample of linen and cutting it into three pieces does not constitute taking three samples. <laughs> That's not the same thing. And and if you took it all from the same part of the cloth, this violated the protocol. So I, I really, I really think that all these things together have to leave us with huge questions about that date. And as a matter of fact, I, I think quite honestly, we can dismiss that date. Yeah, I, I absolutely. And, and I really, uh, I, I read Joe Marino's 1988 yes. carbon testing book. And yes. well, I, I should say I read about a half of it. I, I, I'm fascinated by books that have those kind of facts, just one after the other. And, right. uh, and I'm hoping to finish it, but man, it, it is incredible. The politics around the shroud, first of all, the politics around the taking of the samples and the politics around the dating process and the money that could have been made if I come up with a potential positive result versus a negative result or some right. other result. And, right. and um, you uh, know, and I you like, know, him, I, you know, when you think about those, those kind of politics and you think about the politics in the U.S. between the Republicans and Republicans and the Democrats, we have no <laughs> we can't even light a candle against the politics that took place over there. <laughs> no, not at all. Not at all. And and I, I think that, um, you know, it, it is unfortunate that the carbon 14 dating grabbed the biggest headlines when the STIRP results were published in dozens of peer-reviewed journals. And, um, and, and you know, the, the, the debunking of the carbon-14 dating has not gotten nearly as much attention as the carbon-14 dating itself did. And so that's unfortunate. Yeah. But, but I think it also gives us an opportunity, because we do see it, that there is more interest in the shroud now than there has been in the last 20 years. And, and I think that this is why, is that that information is beginning to trickle out there. And, um, and, and people who are, um, who are interested in serious inquiry um, will get past that carbon-14 dating and, and look at some of the other evidence. Because, because that's what I, as I said, that's what I always tell people is, or I'll ask people, well, tell me something else you know about the shroud. And quite often it's nothing. So there's an opportunity to have conversations. Yeah, I like that. And I'm gonna I'm gonna use that. So thank you very much. I yeah. hope you and I'll, yeah. I'll quote you on it as well. Okay. <laughs> That's you don't have to quote me. It's not original. <laughs> but because I, I really like that to be able to say, well, okay, so now that, what else do you know about it? That yes. really is a, a good yes. segue exactly. into uh, into kind of getting them past the you know the 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 the, the carbon 14 dating. And you're so right. The uh, the the ref refutation of the 1988 dating is nowhere near what the press was for that that you yeah. know when those three guys were sitting up there in front of that blackboard with the 1260 to 1390. There's no you know big article that comes out and says, "Yep, those guys were wrong." And, and guy, let's don't forget they have an exclamation point behind their date. Yeah. Yeah, which yeah. interesting, interesting notation for science, which is supposed to be neutral. I've always wondered why you needed to put an exclamation point there. That is, uh, you know, you, you you mentioned that I never really thought about that, but you're yes. right. That is that That's is there. That is there. very disturbing to me about that photograph. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, and I, I what I like too about the whole process is, uh, you know, you talked about the three samples, and they weren't really three samples; they were one sample cut in three, and and then they were each cut, and then you know you look at the the errors or the differences in ages across all of those uh, various pieces and how different they are, and that how you can't have a statistically significant out to three standard deviations and come right. up with that date of twelve sixty to thirteen ninety. No. It's, no, just it's just fascinating. And so here really are these, these scientists and they're claiming to be, you know, representing science when they did this and they, they broke all the rules. They broke every yeah. rule. Yeah. And, and I think that that is, it's, um, it, it really is a tragedy in the sense that science had an opportunity to do what science does best here, which is to give us an objective um, result. And, 
And had the protocol been followed, and I'm not, I'm not even sure that if the protocol had been followed, that there had been samples taken from across the cloth to get a spectrum of dates in a double blind test that no one compared their results until the day they were published. Um, I'm not sure what we would have gotten then. I mean, it, we still don't know how much uh, environmental contamination is in the cloth itself, but I would feel a lot better about trusting that process. Um, and, and I also think that, you know, we have a lot to look forward to with regard to new testing, new, new ways of environmentally testing the cloth that will not involve carbon, de carbon uh, destruction.